Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Linda Schenk and I'm the Executive Officer for Wine Communicators of Australia. Today, we'll be hearing from Kirsten Hannan and Ali Lockwood from Wine Australia, who'll be speaking to us about Australian wine exports and Wine Australia's international activity. The content is very rich today, and so therefore we might not have uh, much time for questions at the end. However, if you do think of some questions, there's a little Q&A button down the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to type in your questions. If we get the time, we will definitely answer them. If not, they will be sent over to the Wine Australia team for them to answer at a later stage for you. This webinar, as per usual, will be recorded and a recording link will be sent out to you at a later stage so that you can have a look at the presentation again, should you need to. It is now my pleasure to pass you over to Kirsten. Thanks, Linda, and uh, welcome to everyone who's joined us today. Um, so I'm just going to cover off um, the latest results for Australian wine exports. So firstly, I'll look at the overall performance, and after this, I'll go into a little bit more detail of our top export destinations. So in 2018-19, Australian wine exports increased in value by 4% to $2.86 billion as average prices reached a record level of $3.58 per litre. The volume of exports decreased by 6% to 89 million 9 litre case equivalents or 801 million litres. So it's estimated that 63% of Australian wine produced is exported by over 2,700 exporters to 125 destinations. The volume of wine exported equates to roughly 20.5 million glasses of Australian wine available around the world. In value and terms, Australian wine exports to continue to reach record levels after five consecutive years of growth. In, value terms on the, in volume terms, on the other hand, this was the first year-on-year -year decline in a financial year. The volume decline came from a decrease in shipments below an average value of $2.50 per litre. Just looking into more detail about the unpackaged versus packaged, so shipments of unpackaged wine increased in value by 6%, to 533 million to reach record levels, but decreased in volume by 6% to 49 nine litre case equivalents. The average value of unpackaged wine exports increased 12% to $1.21. Looking at packaged wine, which includes glass bottles, soft pack and other alternative packaging, um, I just wanted to give you a sense before I go any further, though, is that glass bottle makes up 98% of that packaged wine total. So here we've got exports increasing in value by 3% to $2.33 billion, and de but decreasing in volume 6% to 40 million 9-litre case equivalents. The combination of the increased value and lower volume means the average value of bottled wine increased 10% to $6.44 per litre another record amount. Just focusing on um, what's contributing to the volume decline. So uh, Australia's 2018 and 2019 vintages were smaller than the record breaking 2017 vintage, meaning there is relatively less supply available for shipping overseas. And the graph on the right highlights the 2019 estimate has fallen below the 10 year average. International supply pressures are also a factor here. They've eased um, after a larger 2018 global vintage, which has increased competition in the market. Uh, we've also got a, a trend to trade up for better quality wine in order to treat oneself. And this is growing in established wine markets around the world, which is pushing down volume, but increasing value. This trend is closely linked to other trends, including health and wellness, and the conscious consumer now, and the ageing population. Also contributing to the decline in bottled shipments is the well-established trend for larger wine exporters to move towards bottling their wine overseas rather than in Australia. This shift is amplified when the Australian dollar is strong in comparison to other global currencies. 
but we've also got commercial and environmental factors at play as well. And shipping in bulk containers is proven to leave a smaller carbon footprint. In 2018-19, there was robust growth in most price segments. Record levels were achieved in exports with an average value of $10 per litre and above in both value and volume. Wine exports valued um, at $5 and under, on the other hand, declined in both value and volume, down 4% and 9% respectively. The decline in export volume priced at $5 or under was experienced across all container types, except in soft packs. In general, this movement across both ends of the price segments reflects the global trend again towards this premiumization or the trading up but drinking less. Now we're just going to sort of analyze the data based on um, grouping the exporters based on how many cases they export in 2018-19. But overall, there was 2,729 active exporters, a 19% increase from the previous year. During the period, there was 1,866 companies that either started exporting or increased the value of their exports, contributing 386 million to the growth in overall value. This growth growth was partially offset by 1,248 exporters whose export value decreased or they ceased shipment altogether and their exports declined by 266 million. So on the graph you can see the value growth rates by exporter size illustrate largely positive performances but nearly all exporter size groups contributed to the fall in volume. The largest exporters make up 2% of the number of exporters but contribute to 87% of total volume of exported wine, while the smallest exporters make up 90% of all exporters and they only contribute to 5% of the volume. While it's easy to see on this graph that there's been record growth in value to mainland China, it is also notable that there has been record growth as well in export value to New Zealand, the UAE and Thailand. And just following it on from this record theme, um, some of Australia's most popular varieties experienced excellent growth in the last 12 months and making up 30% of overall export value, straight bottled Shiraz increased by 9% in value to 701 million. And again, the highest on record. Other records came from Shiraz Cabernet Sauvignon and Shiraz Mataro. Straight bottled Chardonnay represented 8% of export value and grew by 3% to 186 million. Cabernet Sauvignon, the seven most popular straight bottled variety at 15% declined by 6%. And other bottled variety label claims which experienced growth included Pinot Grigio, Pinot Noir and Duroff. So, for the next set of slides, I'm going to focus on our top three markets, which are mainland China, the US and UK. And this dashboard summarises the key measures for Australian exports to mainland China. So just following the little boxes that highlight the information, exports to mainland China increased 8% in value to 1.09 billion while volume went down 17% to 16 million nine litre cases. Down in the graph on the bottom right, so shows exports to China have grown rapidly over the last five years, with export value continuing to reach another record level in 2018-19. Volume on the other hand has declined for the first time since growth began but this resulted in the average price per litre compounding by 5% each year since 13-14. So the volume dec decrease is due to a decline in shipments below $2.50 per litre. Shipments with an average value of $10 and above increased 24% to $604 million. The decline at the bottom of the price spectrum and the growth at the top 
has resulted in a 30% increase in the average value of wine shipped to mainland China to $7.44 per litre. Unpackaged exports, which represents 6% of Australian wine volume exported to mainland China, decreased in volume by 48% and 11% in value to reach an average value per litre of $2.29. Packaged exports, on the other hand, increased by 10% in value, while volume dropped by 2%. So due to the value growing while volume fell, the average value per litre increased by almost a dollar to $8.78 per litre. The majority of the exports to mainland China were reds uh, in the last financial year, while whites made up just a 3% of export volume. Of the packaged wines with label claims, the most popular varietal was Shiraz, followed by Cab Sav and Shiraz Cab Sav. And the only white in the top 10 was Chardonnay. So this slide here shows the overall wine imports to China so we can have a look at what's happening in the market overall. With such significant growth over the years, it was inevitable that the percentage growth rates would slow for mainland China. Between the last financial year and this one, the total volume of wine imported to China declined by 19%, along with value, that's in Aussie dollars, down by 10%. This decline in volume was consistent across sparkling, bottled and unpackaged. For value, sparkling wine was the only category to experience an increase, up by 7%, while bottled declined by 11% and bulk by 1%. The International Wine and Spirit Record, or referred to as the IWSR, recently reported that the decline in imports, which had been rising ahead of consumption, has led to a build-up of stock of imported wine. And while there's been that reported, which, sorry, which the market is slowly working through, while there's been a reported build-up of stock of imported wine, there were also supply issues experienced um, in particular from France, Spain, Italy and Chile in 2017, but all have since reported good harvests for 2018. Further to this, we are seeing an impact on imports due to pricing, while the Chilean peso, for example, being quite favourable for exports. We are also observing that unstable trade conditions and a slowing economy are resulting in reduced demand. When looking at imports by country of origin and how they've changed over the years, it's becoming obvious that in recent times, consumers are now more open to other regions. You can see from the graph here that France's decline has been significant enough for Chilean imports to now surpass French wine. More than half of the decline in volume came from France with losses in both bottled and unpackaged. Australian wines have been doing well up until recently but volume was down 15% due to a large drop in unpackaged. Bottled, however, increased by 1%. While it does fluctuate from month to month, the latest results have Australia as the third largest import market by volume and the second largest behind France in value. Australia's market share has also jumped 12 percentage points since 1415 to 24%, compounded by the recent contraction in the market. Chile has experienced increases, but this is solely attributed to growth in unpackaged. Their share also increased, but this one by a much smaller rate, uh, by five percentage points since 1415 to 28%. Now on to the US market. For 2018-19, exports to the US increased 2% in value to $432 million although we saw a decline in volume of 4% to 16.9 million litre cases. After peaking in value in 1617 and a decline since then for several year on year periods, the value of exports to the US appeared to be slowly turning around. Exports with an average value between $5 and $7.49 increased along with shipments value between $7.50 to $9.99 per litre. The standout growth from this segment has been partly due to some major companies moving products into higher price brackets. At the commercial end, wines with an FOB value of $2.49 and under increased by 3%. 
Unpackaged exports, which represent 45% of Australian wine volume exported to the US, decreased in volume by 3%, but increased by 5% in value to reach an average value per litre of $1.18. Packaged exports increased in value by 1%. Pleasingly though, although the um, volume of packaged wine shipped to the US has declined, principally at lower price points, the average value of exports has been on an upward trend, growing on average 3% each year over the last five years to $4.16. This again reflects the higher premium being paid on Australian wine. Now the mix between um, the categories is a lot different to China for the US with half of the exports um, being reds, followed by still whites at 44%. And of the packaged wines with label claims, the most popular varietal was Chardonnay, followed by Cab Sav. So the US are the largest consumers of wine in the world, according to Wine Intelligence, but around two thirds of these cons uh, consumers drink local wines. Up until September, September 2016 as well, they, the US was the largest market by value for Australia, but has since been overtaken by China. So the IWSR reported that in 2018, the market split between on and off trade was 20 and 80% respectively. With that in mind, when we look at IRI worldwide in the US off-premise still wine results, Australia was the fourth largest country of origin with a value worth 522 million US dollars, which represented 4% of the market. But it was the third largest by volume with 6.8 million cases. As noted earlier about the US drinking mostly US wines, in the off trade, this was worth 10.24 billion US dollars. And not close behind, but still second, Italian wines were worth 1.5 billion US dollars, then France at 785 million US, just to put us into perspective. For Australia in the last 12 months, off trade sales declined 1% in volume, but value pleasingly remained steady. Australian sales are heavily weighted to the popular price point between $4 and $8 a bottle, and Australia holds a 13% market share of the segment. Year on year, this price segment has declined for Australia and across the total US market as well. What's encouraging is that Australian wine priced above US $25 per bottle has grown 9%, along with wines priced between $8 to $11 US, which was up 25%. Growth from both of these price segments was greater as well than the total US overall market, which was 4 and 1% respectively. There's also positive news in the US on trade for Australian wine. It has increased 4% in value to US 275 million, but that's in the year ending March 2019, according to Nelson CGA. And just quickly, the varieties from Australia that have been doing well in the off trade over the last year by value were Chardonnay, Cab Sauv, Pinot Gris and Pinot Noir. So this is my final dashboard. Um, I'm just going to be focusing on the United Kingdom. So exports to the UK decreased by 3% in value to 372 million and 4% in volume to 26 million nine litre cases. While well, reaching a low point in um, 16, 17, exports have been on the rise as a number of large brands implemented their pre-Brexit strategies of getting additional product into market to mitigate any disruption to exports. But we didn't know what was going to happen. So with the delay, the volume decline in 2018, 19 shows that these strategies have since wrapped up. Our regional general manager in Europe, Laura Jewell, commented that there continues to be a lack of certainty around the timing outcomes, implications and impacts on trade from Brexit. Larger brands continue to hold stock above their usual levels, although this was lower in the 12 months to June than in the 12 months to March. The first quarter stockpile levels saw an increase in exports, particularly in unpackaged wine, as companies and brand owners sought to ensure that stock will be available across Europe. Exports with an average value between $5 to $7.50 increased, 
along with shipments value between $750 to $10 per litre. The strongest growth came at $20 to $100 per litre. This segment is showing positive signs on a month by month basis with value trending upwards throughout the financial year. Unpackaged exports, which represent 84% of Australian wine volume exported to the UK, increased in volume by 1% and 8% in value to reach an average value per litre of $1.08. Packaged exports, on the other hand, declined by 22% in volume and 14% in value. The average value per litre was high though at $4.24, bouncing back from the last two years. Very similar to the US, half of the exports to the UK were reds and the majority of that was sent over was unpackaged. So the results look a little different to the graph uh, next to it because this is on packaged wines based on label claims and the most popular varieties here were Chardonnay followed by Shiraz then Sauv Blanc, Cab Sauv and Merlot. So the UK is the large, third largest importer of wine in the world. And it has always been Australia's number one destination for wine by volume. As mentioned on the previous slide, the majority of Australian wine exports to the UK are sent in bulk containers. And this does have an impact on the value figures. So the market split between on and off trade was 14 and 18% respectively. And according to IRI Worldwide, Australia has been number one in the UK off-premise still wine market for 20 years. And the value in the last financial year was reported at 1.2 billion pounds, which represented 23% of the market from 18.2 million cases. The next largest market was Italy at half the value at 612 million pounds, then the US, then France. There was a decline of 2% in the volume sold in the off trade year on year, but value was, it remained steady. Australian sales are heavily weighted to price points under seven pounds per bottle, and Australia holds a 26% market share of the segment. Given this, it is thought to offer limited scope for significant growth. Australia's market share of sales above seven pounds per bottle is comparatively low at 12%. This segment presents an opportunity for future growth by gaining market share from competitors, as well as growing with the market. However, the market is significantly smaller than that below the seven pounds per bottle, but with growth in the seven to nine pound and the 10 to 20 pound price bands, being greater than the overall growth in those, um, it suggests that demand is increasing in the premium end. And again, I'm just gonna to touch quickly for the varieties that have been doing well in the off trade over the last year. We've got Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Grigio and Cab Sav. And while I've spent a lot of time focusing on our top three, I just thought I'd cherry pick some others in our top 10 in terms of destinations. So I'll just pick on Canada first. Australian wine exports decline marginally in value to 198 million, while volume declined by 4% in volume uh, to 7.3 million nine litre case equivalents in the last five years, sorry, in the last financial year. And we've got both bottled and unpackaged wine exports declining in volume down 4%. And we've also got, uh, so that's dropped in both those areas. In terms of exports to Singapore, they've remained relatively steady for value at 87 million and volume at 712,000 nine litre case equivalents. While the results did not change greatly, we've got a bit of a mix um, between what's occurred. So we've got um, exports with an average value between $2.50 to $5 per litre increasing by 15%. $7.50 to $10 per litre also increasing by 54% in value to 8.4 million. And then we've got between 30 to $50 per litre increasing from 7 million to 9 million to make up 10% of all exports to Singapore. But these increases were offset by the declines across all other price bands. Finally, I just want to cover off Japan. This experienced decline in value of 4% to 51 million despite volume increasing 12% to 1.9 million litre case equivalents. The volume decline was due to significant growth in unpackaged exports, which overtook bottled exports in the past 12 months to make up 47% of all exports. 
This is the result of the cut to all tariffs on bulk wine, effective from the 15th of January 2015 through the Japan-Australian Economic Partnership Agreement. Tariffs on bottled wine will not be eliminated until the 1st of April 2024. The value of bottled exports declined by 14% to 36 million, driven by declines across all major price segments, except for $7.50 to $10 per litre. So finally, in conclusion, I'm just about to wrap up. Um, we've got uh, growth in um, the, the increase fine wine exports. We've got growth is spread across a broad section of exporters. We've got China remaining to be a key driver for Australian exports, but we've got growth in other key markets. And as you can see, we've got significant opportunities uh, for premium wine in the US and Australia remains number one in the UK. Um, despite what's happening in ex in, from Brexit. And just to wrap up, thank you for your time today. If you're interested in finding more information on Australian wine exports, please visit Wine Australia website. If you're a levy payer, you will have access to the export report and the off-trade reports referred to in my presentation. You can also contact the Market Insights team for any export data queries through our email which is market.insights at wineaustralia.com. Thank you. I'll now hand over to Ali. So while you're um, changing the presentation over, could I just read out a quick question? I know we weren't going to do questions, but I want to read it out for you anyway. Yes. Um, understanding wine is uh, in bottle is 90%, 98% of export volume. Is there any growth in demand for wine in kegs? Kegs. Um, that's such a... Yeah, I don't actually have any data to track wine in kegs, but I can definitely look into that. No worries. We'll send you the person's name and details later. And you yeah. can. Um, it actually also one. depends on the market as well, because some are more open to alternative packaging styles too. No worries. But yes. Thank you. Now we'll pass over to Ali. Thanks, Linda. And thanks, Kirsten. Good afternoon. My name's Ali Lockwood. I'm the Manager for Stakeholder Engagement for Wine Australia. Um, we're really going to shift gears now after Kirsten's presentation and look at a very top line strategy of marketing that we'll, we will deliver in the next 12 months throughout FY1920. This for us is really a long term strategy that we've been working consistently towards for a number of years. So to start with, it's a very busy page, but it's an important one for us. Um, let's visit our marketing strategy on a page for 2019-20. Our global vision is to increase the perception of and demand for Australian wine and wine tourism among the consumers and wine trade in China and the US. So many of you would know about the $50, uh, $50 million package. Um, that has really, um, determined the priorities for Wine Australia in terms of our international activity. So the US and China are a key priority for us for the remainder of this financial year as part of the deliverables in that package. Our strategic pillars are consistent everywhere and rely on our launch and expansion of the Made Our Way branding. Um, you can see Australian Wine Made Our Way on the slide there, and I'll go into more detail on that in a minute. Distribution and usage of Australian wine discovered. Again, I'll go into that um, in more detail shortly. Um, and constant engagement and activity of gatekeepers around the world to underpin our logic with promotion of Australian and tourism to drive our messaging. So Australian wine made our way. Well, it's been over a year since we launched this global brand platform for the Australian wine sector. We set out, our goal was to really cut through the sea of sameness of wine marketing and to shift the conversation by talking in a different way. We created a brand platform to position Australian wine as uniquely and differently as possible and to provide authentic stories and knowledge to our audience. Bringing Made Our Way to life globally, um, we've run events in and rolled it out in, from London to Hong Kong, retail promotions in China and key expos. Made Our Way is now fully rolled out within Wine Australia and our key international markets. The Made Our Way style guide is also available for you to use and, and to adapt with your branding as well too. We um, store the style guide on the image gallery, which is located at the Wine Australia website, right down the very bottom of the homepage. 
um, and it will link you through to our image gallery and it is all included there for the wine sector to access as well. So looking at platform development for consumer website and social media, we've spent a long time over the last 12 months resetting our engagement strategy. Um, historically, we've been focused on B2B. That's really all we've been able to manage as an organisation, but with the $50 million investment, it's really given us an opportunity to refocus on consumer engagement and reset our digital platforms and how we engage with the consumer. So this year we've launched a consumer digital platform, www.australianwine.com. So this really amplifies Made Our Way, but it tells the story of our people and our places in a way that consumers want to hear it. It allows us to engage in a completely different way and get um, deeper reach. It also allows us to reset social media to align to our digital platform for the first time. The site's in English and it's also in Mandarin. It gives us a significant platform to drive increased consumer engagement, both in Australia and China, for the first time directly with the consumer. It's modern and designed to reach a global audience. Its role is to inform, educate the consumer audience with information about regional wine events, regions, wines and grape varieties and people. It becomes a unified tool as a call to action for campaign activity in social media. And since the launch late last year, we've seen great results in sessions and page views and click through rates. We've also reset our social media channels to ensure relevant contents provided to relevant audiences. Social media is now um, a must have part of any marketing strategy and it needs to be targeted at the right user. So our strategy overall is to earn the hearts and minds through storytelling and conversations. But we recognise that each channel is different and audiences use them in different ways. So on the screen, we've got examples of social media feeds across Instagram, Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. And what we're finding is that our strategy is working. It's delivering relevant content to the relevant audience. Engagement's at a record high, particularly on Instagram and Facebook, and we've experienced great success with paid social media campaigns. So we have and will continu continue to invest in social media paid campaigns in um, FY1920. So moving to influencer engagement, another critical part of our role as um, Wine Australia. So influencer marketing takes the social media message to a different level and allows us to develop campaigns to drive awareness, engagement and messaging around Australian wine. We've partnered with Alibaba in this space last year with the Chufei Churan twins, um, who you could say they're the Kim Kardashians of China. They came to Australia and live streamed the experience back to China to hundreds of thousands of consumers who are actively purchasing products on their recommendations. We're also currently partnering with seven US social media influencers at the moment to drive awareness in the US and we'll continue this campaign with them during the financial year. Gatekeeper engagement or our visits program is also a critical part of what we do and is something we'll continue for the rest the remainder of this financial year and beyond. In 2018-19, we had 154 guests visit Australian wine regions with 33 media guests writing 54 international articles on wine regions and wine tourism. We visited 19 different regions throughout the year, 124 days spent in regions and over 3,000 wines tasted. So perception change is, is the single biggest driver of why we invest in international guests coming to Australia. And we've been measuring this as well. So we've seen significant results in our pre and post survey of guests with scores rising from 7.5 to 9.38 based on their experiences. They go home with a significantly different view of Australian wine before, uh, than before they arrived. So we'll certainly continue this program moving forward. Content capture is another really critical part of um, what we do and, and um, something we've been able to grow, grow as part of the $50 million project. So we've been undertaking in the past year or so one of our most comprehensive content capture projects to provide a lasting legacy of assets covering people, place and process. 
We've um, phot photographed 22 regions and 300 different personalities. Given our category focus, we've tended to highlight the talent rather than the brand story. And we also highlight generational stories wherever possible. We also overlaid tourism angles, so a sense of place is captured through the storytelling and visuals. Again, this content is all available at the Wine Australia Digital Asset Library at the bottom of our homepage at www.wineaustralia.com. There's a web link there on the page as well. I'd highly recommend you to have a look at that. Um, there's a number of different assets there for you to utilise in your own businesses. Look, there's, there's lots of images I could show you, but I've just included one. Um, slide here um, and you I guess the reason why I've included this is you can see the photography we're doing has quite a deliberate tourism angle so the imagery we're taking really demonstrates the natural landscapes and our people and moves away from the sea of sameness we found vineyards and vines and grapes can look similar from country to country but our landscapes and our wine personalities are a unique asset which we must promote so moving on to education made our way, or Australian Wine Discovered as the program is um, called. So this for us is another legacy piece of work as part of the $50 million package. You may already be aware of it. Um, it was launched in London in, um, at the Australian Trade Tastings in January this year, and it's already picked up an award in the UK for best trade campaign, currently rolling out across the US, China, and the rest of the world. It's really setting the benchmark for wine education globally. Our approach to leverage education as a marketing channel and develop content is, that is world leading. So the great thing about Australian Wine Discovered is that it has 25 modules. It's one of the largest libraries of Australian wine content available globally. Um, they're all completely editable modules. They're all available for free. You do not need to pay for them. Um, open access and available for instant download by wineries, importers, distributors, retailers, educators. Completely editable, as I mentioned, so you can drop in your bottle imagery, your logos, your winemaker pictures, etc. Nine modules will be available by September in Mandarin for the Chinese market, and we're also adding consumer ebooks to the consumer site. So moving to North America. So Far From Ordinary, what is this? Some of you might have heard about this. Um, Far From Ordinary is a major campaign and investment that strives to change the perceptions of Australian wine in the US. So we recognise that for many Americans, Australia is a world away geographically, culturally and environmentally. So we're bringing Australia's most unique and special experiences to everyday life in the US. The Far From Ordinary campaign gives us an opportunity to talk about people, place and process our way, the Australian way. We're trying to smash and break perceptions of Australia. We're targeting socially engaged millennials who are looking for something different. And they're wanting and embracing change and our Far From Ordinary campaign delivers a un unique expression of Australia. So some imagery depicting the event staging that we're, um, we are able to deliver across the US shows that this really is quite different from your standard tasting. The Far From Ordinary campaign will help us to transport Australia to the US through digital, print, social and on-site events. The campaign is the largest Australian wine promotion ever held in the US. It's multi, a multi-channel program of trade and consumer events, wholesaler activity and retail tie-ins that drive visibility in sales. Wine Australia has invested 7 million Australian dollars to change the hearts and minds of trade and consumers and to lift export growth in the US market. Um, you can see the first event, Far From Ordinary New York City Consumer Activation. Um, the wine tasting activation goes beyond the glass and showcases our unique natural beauty and strong sense of place. We'll be hosting a major consumer event across three nights in New York in mid-September. A multi-room experience will immerse guests within Australia's diverse wine regions. Split between four zones will showcase an extensive selection of Australian wines in scenes that really draw on Australia's natural environment. We're targeting 400 paid consumers per night, 
ageing um, with a target age um, range of 21 to 34 years for the consumer event. Tickets are now on sale through australianwine.com and we're pushing this um, significantly through social media and would encourage you to do the same. Australian Women in Wines Awards will also be held in New York in September around the same time as the consumer activation. So once again, we're partnering with um, the awards owner, Jane Thompson. We previously partnered with Jane and hosted the awards in London a couple of years ago. Um, so it's good to be partnering with her in New York this time round. The awards will be presented in New York with an awards ceremony and cocktail reception. Um, there is information there saying entries are open until 1st of August. Obviously that date's gone by, um, so nominations are now closed. Finalists will be announced very shortly and the winner will be announced on the night on the 17th of September. So Wine Australia is presenting an honorary award which will be given to an American woman who's recognised as a big supporter of Australian wine. It's strictly invitation only and we are targeting around 120 key trade and media to attend. Another component of um, the Far From Ordinary campaign is the New to Market Showcase. And this really is an extension of the market entry program, which we currently run and uh, is headed up by Damon Musher in our U US market. Essentially, this brings wineries and importers together. We have 18 participating wineries from across Australia and 18 um, top tier A importers in attendance. And we'll be running a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings a networking lunch and a happy hour as well. We've also held an information session for these 18 companies in Adelaide last month. A key component of our activation in the US is the Far From Ordinary Roadshow. So the Roadshow covers uh, six cities and it kicks off in New York on the 19th of September. And then it travels to Chicago on the 23rd, Miami on the 25th, Dallas, LA and San Francisco. Across all the cities, we're targeting 2,500 attendees. We're inviting trade, media, educators. Um, and in each of the cities, regions and um, the state of Victoria will be running masterclasses as well. We have McLaren Vale, Margaret River, um, Victoria and AFFW running a program across all those cities with mini masterclasses. We'll be incorporating an aroma wall, which we developed in conjunction with the Australian Wine Research Institute in New York City. Um, and we'll also be having Australian Wine Discovered Lounges pr promoting our educational assets as well. The Roadshow concludes with an exclusive invitation only event called Decanted. Some of you may be aware of this from last year. We ran a similar program. Um, in Lake Tahoe, and we are running this again. Um, we have 100 VIP, really VVIP, I, I should say, trade attending from across the country. We're not repeating um, uh, invitees from last year. They're a new group of people. We've got a fantastic lineup of guest speakers. We've got 16 winemakers, up from 13 in 2018. Um, we've got Ed Carr, Prue Henschke, Vanya Cullen, Michael Dillon, Tim Kirk, Timo Mayer, just to name a few. We've already had 55 people confirm, um, so we're well on our way to creating a memorable experience for this influential group of gatekeepers. We're also supporting wholesalers with a dollar for dollar matching matched funding incentive in place to help drive education and sales of Australian wine. Um, we're running programs which includes distribution drives, national placement incentives and educational events. At present, we've seen, we have seven wholesalers participating in across 12 different states, which is a great result. In addition to that, we have 570 individual stores that will have point of sale material um, reflecting far from ordinary campaigns, social media, displays and tastings throughout the month of September. Wine.com is worthy of a mention. It's a major online promotion. Um, it starts in mid-August with four um, EDMs going out to up to 350,000 online wine consumers. Each EDM will have different wine and regional messaging incorporated into it. 
This is the largest program Wine.com's ever done for Australia, and we're anticipating um, Australian skew count will be driven up by 5% during the um, period of the promotion. We're also supporting this with social media advertising um, in a big way as well. I'll just mention um, there's too many to go through on this list, but Vino Volo is also um, worth mentioning. Um, there's 47 stores in 36 airports and we'll be dedicating multiple wine fl flights at their airports um, to Australian wine. So really ramping up the consumer education focus and giving high visibility for travellers coming through the airports. To complement that and in conjunction with the retailer program, Tastings and winemakers um, will be conducting events across the following events. I won't go through them all. Unfortunately, there is just not time. Uh, venues rather. And moving to North Asia. So premiumization is still the key to success in China, driving relevant activity and messages that reinforce our unique Australian messaging. It's all about building awareness with KOLs or key opinion leaders, sommeliers, media and trade. It's about driving focus in key retail and on-premise accounts and it's all about harnessing social media, particularly around the Australian Wine Discovered Educational Program and Made Our Way Messaging. And it's all about investing in training and commercial activity with major partners. So the seventh annual Wine Australia China Awards will be taking place in Shanghai on the 11th of November this year. Wine Australia China Awards provides a platform to celebrate and reward key supporters of Australian wine in China. Our goal is to continue to build the awards into one of the most prominent celebrations of Australian wine in China and to have it become the highlight event in the Chinese wine sector's annual calendar. Currently around 200 VIP invited guests to the award um, a gala dinner including importers, distributors, retailers, on-premise educators, Australian government bodies, wine and lifestyle media and KOLs. So a great cross-section of um, key influences in China. Um, this is an image of the venue from the 2018 awards hosted by James Halliday, the Bulgari Hotel in Shanghai. So it really is a, um, a very 007 event. Um, two new awards, we have eight in total. There are two new awards, the Best Australian Wine Promotion Off-Premise and Best Emerging Australian Wine Advocate. Our judges, we have a really esteemed lineup of judges in both the trade and the media awards, including Lu Yang, Simon Wang, who some of you might have seen last year as a speaker from AOC at the Exporter Update in Adelaide. Um, representatives from Langton's Treasury, negotiants, um, and a number of high profile media and educators as well to complement. Moving to Pro Wine China. Pro Wine China is a major event for, um, for Australian producers. It will be held in November from the 12th to the 14th, directly after the China Awards. Um, we'll be running three masterclasses, um, both forum masterclasses and on the pavilion. And we have six, over 60 exhibitors already signed up. We anticipate around um, 19 to 20,000 trade and um, visitors from across China that will visit and about 50% originate from Shanghai and the remainder from outside of Shanghai. CIIE is also worth mentioning. So it's a government led event led by the Chinese government. It's called the International Import Exhibition. That runs just prior to the China Awards from the 5th to the 10th of November. Wine Australia will have a presence there, albeit um, limited to five individual booths um, in the Australian Pavilion. And we're collaborating, collaborating very closely with the RDCs, um, MLA, Dairy Australia, to have an open kitchen and bar area on an Australian food and agri pavilion. Chengdu is also coming up in March 2020. Again, a major event for us as well. Um, and it is usually, it will be held across the Chengdu Food and Drinks Fair and a hotel show with um, the venue to be confirmed. It was the Shangri-La last year, sorry, this year. Um, we have 80 um, or more, over 80 signups for both events. And we're currently pulling together um, the program for this specific event. 
Moving into um, a couple of major items, it only seems really like yesterday that we were country of honour at Fin Expo in Hong Kong in 2018, but it's time to go back in 2020. So we won't have the um, scope of space that we had last time. We had around 800 square metres. This year we've got just over 400 square metres for the Australian Pavilion. Um, but we will, it's still a significant space and it really is the last hurrah of the package and a significant offering in, in terms of scale and presence um, will still be present. The China Roadshow kicks off two days later and will continue on to a four city roadshow and that will be supported by Austrade running a Festival of Australia program at the same time across mainland China. So the China Roadshow, you can see by this map, um, the roadshow kicks off in uh, Nanjing, then it moves to Qingdao, Jiaomin, and, Guang, and finishes up in Guangzhou. The timeline for this is um, demonstrated in, in, on this slide. So the VIN Expo exhibitor briefing kicks off on the 25th and the event will be held from the 26th to the 28th. On the 30th and the 31st of May, there will be a, um, an AFL match held in Shanghai, a series of um, AFL events as well and um, dinners, et cetera, and supporting events. So it's worth bearing that in mind. Then the China Roadshow kicks off on the evening of Sunday the 31st and um, the 1st of June. So the first venue, Nanjing, is the closest, um, or city rather, is the closest city to Shanghai. So it's easy to transit from Shanghai to Nanjing. It's about a three hour drive. Then of course it moves to Qingdao, Xiamen and Guangzhou. But we can't forget that there are other markets to support. We will continue to develop our activity where possible in conjunction with Austrade, who we have a collaboration partnership with. Um, what's really critical across regions such as Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, Korea and Japan is that we really are focusing upon Australian Wine Discovered and we will be adding um, to our programs during the course of FY1920 in this space. So moving to UK and Europe, um, sorry, no pictures on this slide, but a um, couple of upcoming events um, in October includes the Nordic Roadshow, which will cover off in Denmark, Sweden, Norway and Finland. Um, these, this roadshow is really gaining traction across the region um, and we have this year opened it up to regional masterclasses for the first time as well. We feel the market is evolved enough to be able to um, incorporate this. We'll also have an Australia Redefined tasting on the 17th of September and there are a number of companies participating in that and then flying across for the beginning of um, the, the US Far From Ordinary campaign in, um, on the 19th of September in New York City. Um, Australia Trade Tastings remains um, one of our really critical events in the market in UK. It will be held on the 21st of January in London, London and 27th of January in Edinburgh. Look, it, it really is the key event to, um, for the Australian wine category in the UK market. Um, we usually get between 1,000 to 1,200 visitors um, and the trade firmly have this in their diary as their opportunity to review the Australian wine category. Um, this year we had more than 1,000 wines from 250 producers across the roadshow and we run forum masterclasses as well too. And that opportunity has just gone out. I uh, will be going out to regions shortly to sign up to. Provine as well too. Many of you will be familiar with Provine in Germany, um, held in Dusseldorf. It really is a major event for us. It attracts 60,000 visitors from across the world, including major buyers from Europe, US, Canada and Asia. We, over the years, since 2010, we have really ramped up our presence from 13 wineries to 80 wineries in 2020. Um, tends to get um, full quite quickly. So if you are interested in participating, it is at a wait list scenario at the moment, but I would encourage you to consider um, signing up for 2021 as soon as it's released um, next year. We will be running forum masterclasses and on pavilion masterclasses as well. 
which are generally led by the regions. We'll be running a couple of events, uh, new events in Belgium and Netherlands. Um, well, there'll be regional masterclass opportunities and a trade tasting. They'll be held in April and May next year. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Um, Linda. We've got some questions for you and we've got some time to, to answer them. So uh, let's see how we go with this. First question, wondering if there's any, been any interest in exports to Vietnam um, and are there any events organised from Wine Australia in Vietnam? Well, it's a very good question. Um, look, Vietnam is a very small market for us and there are a lot of challenges in exporting to Vietnam, which many of you will be familiar with, I'm sure. However, um, we do feel there is an opportunity there. We are currently investigating a potential Australian wine discovered um, roadshow across multiple markets and Vietnam is certainly one that's on the table as a market that has expressed an interest in participating. So if we were to do something in Vietnam it would be predominantly educational focused um, and really equipping the trade with all these assets and tools to be able to utilise these in their, in their market. Excellent, thanks. Uh, second question, with the um, Chinese influences that Wine Australia have been working with, how has their perception changed with respect to the Australian, Australian wine? Uh, what was it before and what is it now? I, I can't give you the, the results. Um, I don't have them at, off, at my fingertips, but um, there certainly was significant uptake um, in uh, social media posts and um, we took the Chu Fei twin, Chuan twins on a significant trip across Sydney. We actually had planned to bring them to South Australia in the Barossa, but there was a storm and they weren't able to make it across, unfortunately, but we took them um, to a number of different venues throughout Sydney and exposed them to a number of different regions and wine styles. And that got um, significant uptake from their readership. Great, thanks. And the last question that I have here is, could you mention any Australian brands or case studies of Australian brands that are doing well in the China market and what's the key to their success? Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I the wouldn't be able nugget. to, yeah. I, I, unfortunately, I can't specify specific brands. Um, however, what I would encourage is that you jump on um, something like the China Roadshow so you can actually see it for yourself. Um, look, in terms of support as well too, um, depending on where you're based, a lot of state governments often provide financial support for wineries to participate in international activities. South Australian government, for example, run an accelerator, exporter accelerator program, which refunds a certain percentage of, of your international activities. Um, and it's highly likely other states are doing something similar. Um, Victoria have invested as well too heavily into Victorian producers across events such as the China Roadshow. So the best way to, to get involved is to um, jump on a plane and have a look yourself um, and experience it firsthand and see the brands and see how they're doing. Also bearing in mind that Australian wine is just one part of the story. And, and I think it's easy for us to lose sight of that here in Australia when once you're in the market, it is a very complex and um, broad competitive landscape and there's wines from Chile and France and Italy and I think really understanding how those brands operate is equally important in those categories as well. Um, I'd also recommend that you look at growing wine exports and participating in that program as well. I haven't touched on that during this presentation but essentially growing wine exports is a one day and then a two day followed up by a two day session um, talking about how to maximise your exports in international markets. It doesn't go into brand specifics. I know we'd all love to know that, but it's certainly something unfortunately we can't share. But um, what it does do is it really equips you with all the information that you need to know um, and all the tools to export. The great thing about these programs is that we're running them in a lot of regions across Australia. So they're being held in uh, 22 regions across Australia. Guys, we have one year to deliver this program and it's highly unlikely at this point that it will be run beyond that unless um, we receive additional funding, which again is highly unlikely as well. So I would really encourage you in the next 12 months to um, 
look at participating in one of the growing wine export sessions and um, certainly the, the feedback that we get from companies is that it's been of great value. So that in combined with actually getting into the market and seeing for yourself that competitive landscape is, is um, as much as we can recommend. Excellent. Thank you. Well, um, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Kirsten, for your presentation today. Excellent as usual. It's a pleasure to have you in, what did we call this, a studio? The studio with us. Um, WCA hold a webinar every second Tuesday of the month, so please keep an eye out for our September webinar. It will be in our weekly update and it's also on the event section of our website. There's one piece of information I would like to share with you all today and it's very exciting news. Yesterday we had the opportunity to launch our new wine industry um, mentor program of which the lovely Ali Lockwood here is a mentor in that program. The program runs for six months and uh, it, it attempts to match future wine communicators with recognised wine sector professionals over the next six months or starting in uh, September. Applications, if you know any young future wine communicators that would like to be part of this program, please get onto our website and share it with um, potential people that might like to apply. Applications are short, they close on the 30th of August. So please take advantage of that. It's an excellent program that we've been working on for a very long time to get it launched. Uh, thank you again for joining us today and thank you, Ali and Kirsten. Thank, thank you. you.